people all together bring you honor give you reverence standing as one in your presence by your spirit you have called us chosen people sons and daughters standing as one in your presence this is your church god building this is your church god building jesus Bank. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, I'm so glad that you are here to join us today. Um, my week has been, um, it's been great because I'm on holiday. Um, not everyone is on holiday and I got to, I got to really bask in the love of God this week. Um, and it just showed me how much God really loves me and, and um, I had a bit of a revelation. God is love. 
Meaning a lot, of the th a lot of the times when the scripture is talking about love, it's talking about God. Um, we say love is patient, God is patient. Love is kind, God is kind. One, one that literally, like it, it hit me, the one at the end of the scripture, um, the, sorry, let me just tell you the scripture real quick. It's 1 Corinthians 13 verse four. Um, the one that hit me at the end, it says, um, love never fails. God never fails. And um, it gave me, gave me hope that, you know, God never fails. God is faithful. And um, yeah, so I was very excited about that. Um, I just wanted to let you know, so at the end of the service, I will be um, praying. I'll be taking some prayer requests. So if you have any prayer requests um, that you would like me to pray for, please put them in the chat and I will, I will try and get to them um, at the end of the service. Um, yeah, we're about to get into worship right now. Please enjoy worship and um, thank you. Thank you for joining us today.
just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there's peace within your presence I speak Jesus Jesus in the dark. 
As part of our worship, we're going to take up communion. And those who did not get their elements, if the usher could, could please distribute it around. And those who are online, you can prepare your elements as well. I'm going to read our scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. And it reads, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And communion has been an instruction that Jesus gave to us that we should do this in remembrance of him. And the scripture says that as often as we do this, so presently we are remembering him. Currently we remember what he did on the cross. And it says that then you proclaim the Lord's death. So we need to look back at his death, that he died for us on that cross, that God loved us so much that he wanted to commune with us and forgive our sins and justice was served on the cross for our transgressions so that we can live free and fruitful lives. And so we look back at what he did on the cross and we are currently remembering him. And so it is, as it also says that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back. And so we look forward to his coming back and we are filled with faith that when he comes, he's gonna come back to his beautiful bride. Amen.
one true God, Lord. The one true God. And we adore you this morning, Lord. We lift your name on high this morning, Lord. For there is no one like you in heaven or on earth, Lord God. We have never seen a God like this. We have never seen a God like you, Lord. Full of grace, full of mercy, full of love, full of wonder. Who brings joy, who brings hope, who brings delight, who gives life freely. Let's praise Him. Because <laughs> there's no one like Him. No one like Him. In heaven or on earth. No one like our God. Our mighty God. Our holy God. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. You know, as we've been singing this morning, I just, in my heart, hope was rising. Did anybody else feel that? Right? We're living in a season where we need hope where we need hope. And I was reminded that 1 Corinthians um, 13, verse 13 actually says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Hope doesn't fail. Hope does not fail. You know, we're big on faith, right? We're the people of God. But what do we know about faith? That faith is the substance of things hoped for. Do you want more faith? You need more hope. And in this season, we cannot forsake hope. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it feels like. We cannot forsake hope. Hope never fails. And our hope is not in things. It's not in situations. It's not in people. It's not in what's going to happen next or what isn't going to happen next. Our hope is in God himself. The God of all hope that comforts us. And where you are, won't you just take a moment? If your hope feels like it's failed a bit, mine has recently, right? But today the Lord is going to refresh our hope. And so just where you are, remember who He is. Remember what He's done. Take a minute and just remember what He has done for you. that hope in you never fails, that you do not disappoint, Lord God. You do not disappoint. And Lord God, this morning, we let hope arise, God. We let our hope rise up to you as our Savior, as the Savior of our souls, as the Redeemer of our lives, as the one who has final authority over heaven and earth. And we stand amazed this morning, Lord. We stand amazed at you, Lord God. And God, may we go forth from this moment full of hope. May we remember every second of this coming week, this coming week, month, the rest of this year, that hope doesn't fail. That hope doesn't fail. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise. Thank you, band, for leading us. That was amazing. Uh, let's just say goodbye to the youth that are going upstairs. Uh, if you're uh, 14 or older, you can join them. If you just head to the, the doors over there, somebody will direct you upstairs. And to the rest of us, welcome to the house of God. Won't you find somebody as you're taking your seat and just tell them, hope never fails. <laughs> Wow, it's so good to see you here with us at Every Nation Rosebank. Uh, we are a community with a purpose that honors God, makes disciples, and brings transformation. And every week we do this, and it's not to make anybody awkward, but we just want to welcome those who are with us for the first time. Maybe it's actually your second or third time, but you've never been brave enough to put up your hand. And, and you know what's going to happen. You're going to put up your hand, and we're just going to celebrate you. So if that's you, be brave, put up your hand. Let us just welcome you in our midst tonight. 
I mean, this morning. Do we have any new time? Yes, welcome, 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 welcome. <laughs> We are so blessed that you decided to come and join us this morning. We really pray that God will bless you, that you will walk out of here full of life. Before you leave this morning, through those doors to the left, we've got a guest lounge. We've got some great hot drinks and some snacks that we'd love to share with you. And some of our leaders will be there to answer any questions or to pray for you or anything that you need. But we're so glad you are with us today. Um, we are a multi-generational church, and so if you have um, little ones from 3 to 13, they can go upstairs to the kids' church. If you've got ones younger than that, we've got a mom's feeding room over there, a dad's changing room over there, and if your little ones want to uh, release some energy, you can take them through to the foyer. You'll still be able to hear the service through the Sunday. And just a reminder that um, sometimes parking gets a bit um, squeezed out yeah, in, in the parking lot, right? But we do have more parking up the road at Nando's. What is great about that is you get some exercise, you get to walk down the road to the church, but if you park there five times in a row, you get a free coffee. So that's a great incentive to do that. And I'm handing over to Simon. I bring you greetings from every nation, East London. Okay, why you should be excited is that we are part of this church plant. We sent Tiam and Natasha to go and plant in East London. And uh, two weeks ago, we were there launching, and they had 92 people in the house. If you go back to that slide with the logo Sh Hope Ship, it is uh, docked currently in East London. We got to visit there. They've got a massive bookshop in there. They've got mission teams that are living there that are going in uh, to help with what is happening with the church plant. We didn't plan for them to be there at this time, but the Lord has his ways. So they've been doing some outreaches and inviting people to church. So it's been amazing. I want to share one testimony. It's one of these photos here, there's a guy who was discipled at Every Nation at Nelson Mandela University. He is currently um, an advisor to the premier of the Eastern Cape. And I was just reminded about the power of campus ministry. When we disciple people, we never know where they will end up, especially in this election year that we are in. We're trusting God to see men and women of integrity get into these positions of influence. Amen. And this guy is now part of every nation, East London, and is just sharing the things that God is doing in the premier's office. And one of the things that stood out for us was how clean East London was. Because you can see, when the children of God take over, something must change. Amen. This morning, as I share with you our time of giving, we want to share some needs that we have as the church. We don't always do this. We don't do it frequently. You remember the last time we did this was beginning of last year when we were trusting God uh, to buy a generator and to also uh, have solar panels which has been a blessing that uh, as much as possible, we are able to continue to keep the lights on even when there is electrical problems in the area. Now, what we're believing God for is, if you go to the next slide, is um, we want to have a borehole on the property. And uh, we already have experienced the first miracle. Uh, we found out from this company, as we were trying to get quotations for a borehole, they say, if you are registered for your social responsibility project as a Section uh, 18A, uh, if you have a Section 18A status, we can be able to drill the borehole for free for you. The first miracle already taken place. And you have to supply uh, water to the community, which we are happy about. We can be able to bless the community around us. And also, if you live in the neighborhood, sometimes there have been water challenges in the neighborhood. You can now come to the well and get some water. Praise God. So that's, 
the borehole will be drilled for free, but the tanks, we need to pay for them. Uh, it's about 40,000. The pump is about 17,000. We're rounding it off, so we need about 60,000 for that. If you go to the next slide, you will see that events communication system, it is so that when we are in the service, our events team, our security team can be able to communicate with each other. As you can see right now, we've got security guards on the doors as we do offering to make sure that the place is secure. So please, you can give towards that. And then we also trust in God for kids, youth, and men's bathrooms. Uh, something that you may not know, as Pastor Greg says, amen. So ladies, what you don't know is your bathrooms are much nicer than the men's bathrooms. Because a few years ago, someone gave money to make your bathrooms look the way they look. Man, you did not know this until today that your bathrooms don't look as nice as the ladies' bathrooms. So now it's time that we can uh, zhuzh up the men's bathrooms. We're not saying ladies must go check, but it's not looking good. Prayer garden, chairs, and umbrellas. So we noticed that the foyer is not big enough for fellowship after the service. So we want to open up the prayer garden. We want to put some chairs, umbrellas. After the service, you can grab your coffee. You can sit with your connect group uh, people there. You can also sit with friends there, and we can have a time of fellowship. Also, we're building up towards the BUILD conference that we will be hosting here at Every Nation Rosebank. It is normally our leaders' conference, but we will be opening up the evening for anyone who wants to come. We have Pastor Brett Fuller from Washington, D.C., who will be ministering in the evenings, and you don't want to miss that. So we want to have ample spaces for fellowship. And then we also trust in God that we can uh, have some new couches or you can donate couches because the couches we have in our lounges, whether it's Usher's Lounge, Worship Lounge, Pastor's Lounge, they're falling apart. If you want to donate, if you want to give towards this, you can uh, give on our church uh, bank account. Just mention specifically any of these gifts that you want to give to, or you can just say you want to give towards any capital expenditure. You can just say reference CapEx. We will appreciate that. We also realize that things are tough economically, not only in South Africa, but globally things are tough. And we want to trust God that the Lord will bless his people even in the time of famine. So we want to take this time to pray for you and to pray for your finances. And we're going to trust God to hear financial miracles, even as we become a blessing to this community around us. Amen. Father God, I pray for each and every person that is here today. We pray for even for those online who have given so faithfully towards the work of the kingdom. Lord, we pray, Lord God, that you will bless their finances. We pray for financial miracles, Lord God. We also pray for those who are trusting you for work, mighty God. We pray that we'll hear testimony after testimony that, God, you've come through for them. Lord, your word says, I was young and I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their children begging bread. Lord, you will provide for your people like you did the land of Goshen in Egypt, that your people prospered in the midst of famine. Father, your word also says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he will change his mind. Does he promise and not fulfill? Lord, we believe you will fulfill your promises to watch your people. Bless your children, Lord God, even in this current economic challenges. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, every nation. We are delighted to invite you to our Build Conference happening in May in Johannesburg at our Rosebank congregation, here where we are. It seats 750 people. But what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that God is going to speak to us and we're going to be equipped and upskilled as never before. Some of you heard about the Dave Ward teaching training, which was unbelievable. We're going to have it again this year and uplifted us incredibly in the area of preaching and teaching and ministering the word. What we've got coming up is Pastor Greg Mitchell, and he's going to take full three days, not the evenings, but the full three days, and he's going to equip us in the area of wholeness, us being whole as leaders, and also how we minister wholeness to people. So it's really about counseling. It's really 
equipping us to be better pastors and leaders. So who should be there? Every staff member, every campus uh, director, every campus staff member, but also leaders in your church who are involved in counseling, elders, deacons, senior leaders, even if they're not full-time. Greg Mitchell is outstanding in this area of, of counseling and how to live whole, fulfilled, fruitful lives. So that's the full three days. And in the evening, we've got Pastor Brett Fuller. Many of you know him, North American director, unbelievable. And we've asked him to really share as a father. We don't know when we're going to have him again, but we've told him just let rip, do your thing, speak to, speak to us as if you're not going to see us again. And it's going to be outstanding. So, you know, when it's Christmas time, everybody comes and we're inviting you to come to our Build Conference in Johannesburg in May. It's going to be Christmas for us in May. Please come. We'll see you there. P.S. One more thing. There's going to be an outstanding children's program, kids program. Just like we had at Go, where God met with the kids, the teachers ministered to the children, we're going to have an outstanding program. So bring your kids, take them out of school if you have to. We are trusting for God to just powerfully meet with your children. And then one more thing, PPS. As per our Every Nation, one of our secret core values, there's going to be great coffee there. Looking forward to having a cup with you. Umbrellas and chairs so we can uh, have more time of fellowship over coffee. It is my joy and honor to introduce someone who is not a stranger to this house, Chantel Retliff just launched her book here in Rosebank yesterday, and she gets to share the word with us this morning. Let's welcome Chantel as I continue. So let me tell you a little bit about Chantel. Chantel and Stuart, they've been in this church for many years, and they have since moved uh, to Cape Town. We haven't forgiven them yet for moving to Cape Town. Uh, Chantel is married to Stuart. Together they have uh, five adult children and two grandsons. And we just heard one on the way. <laughs> uh, they live in Cape Town, as I've said. Uh, Chantel is really passionate about preaching the Word of God, teaching the Word of God. She's currently one of the Every Nation Baxter pastors. Let's give one more round of applause to Chantel. <laughs> Good morning. I feel like I've come home. <laughs> I um, definitely have a rosebank-shaped hole in my heart. <laughs> so my heart is full this morning. And I just want to take a moment just to honor you, Pastor Simon and Lindy. You have changed my life. And you have ministered so much to me over the years that I was here. And God is doing something so significant and special Amen. in this place. And, and you are leading that so faithfully. So I just want to honor you. Thank you. So now you've seen a picture of my family and you've heard a bit of an introduction as to who I am. We are in a series here called For Such a Time as This. And globally, as, as a church family, we are in a theme for the year that we are set apart. So I want us to consider that as God's people, we are set apart for such a time as this. But I want to place emphasis this morning on the time. Because as God's people, you and I need to understand the times that we are living in and the times that you and I have been set apart to God in. Because as God's people, we don't live without hope. We know that Jesus is coming again. And we know that if we die before he comes again, we're going to be with him for eternity. But the Lord wants you and I to ensure that we are adequately prepared for what lies ahead. 
adequately prepared for the times that we live in. More specifically, he wants you and I as his people to ensure that we have adequately prepared our faith for the times that we are set apart in. So let's pray together. Father, would you prepare our hearts to receive your word? Would you help us, Lord, to hear what it is your spirit is saying to us today? And would you grace us to give you the appropriate response to the way you reveal yourself to us today? We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The title of my, my sermon this morning is called The Haman Factor. Not the human factor, the Haman factor. So who was Haman? We meet Haman in the third chapter in the book of Esther. You've already met, if you've been following the series, Esther, Mordecai, and our drunken king. But in chapter three, we meet the fourth main character in this narrative, and his name is Haman. So who is he? He's a government official. He's high up in government. In fact, the, the story tells us that he's second in command only to the king. So he sits in a very high influential position in government. And because of his position and his power and his status, the king commands that everybody in the kingdom of Persia needs to bow to Haman. They would have had to bow to the king anyway, but now he's elevated Haman to the status saying, you gotta to bow to this governmental official. And so everybody does, except for one man. His name is Mordecai. He refuses. The, the, the narrative doesn't tell us why, but he refuses. It does tell us that one of the reasons why he refuses is because he was a Jew. So when Haman discovers that Mordecai is not going to follow the king's decree and bow down to him, he becomes enraged, furious, and he has a very illogical response. He decides he's not just gonna deal with Haman, the individual, for his rebellion, but he is gonna wipe out every Jew in the kingdom of Persia. And he successfully convinces the drunken king to pass this bill and make it legal. And they set a date. On this date, we're going to kill every Jew, man, woman, child, in the kingdom of Persia. He was not a good guy. But I want us to zoom out from this narrative that happened thousands of years ago in the ancient kingdom of Persia. And I want us to look at the bigger picture of who Haman is to you and I today. Because he wasn't just a bad guy in history. He represents something to you and I here. Let's have a look at the word. Esther chapter three. Then Haman said to King Aha, I call him King Aha, he's got a very difficult name. There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people. Why were their laws different? They served God. That's why they were different. They served a different God to every other tribe on the earth. And they do not keep the king's laws so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. So the king took his signet ring from his hand. That's a symbol of authority. He has the power to make this decision. 
and gave it to Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, do with them as it seems good to you. The Bible calls Haman the enemy of the Jews. Now the Jews were God's people. They were set apart by God on earth to be the vehicle through which he would rescue and save all of humanity. They weren't set apart because he loved them more than he loved every other nation on the earth. They were set apart to be light and salt, to reveal God. They're not more special than any other nation on the earth or any other people in God's eyes. It's important for us to get that. But Haman's actions to wipe out God's people puts him in direct opposition with God's mission on the earth. And we've just heard what that mission is, to rescue humanity through his son Jesus. Haman represents the influences of our modern world that directly oppose God's mission on the earth today, that directly oppose God's people today, what God's people believe in, what God's people are doing in fulfilling God's mission You see, there are many Hamans in powerful positions in every nation on the earth right now. They sit in seats of power and they are directing nations. They're directing the course of nations. Some of them are so powerful, they're directing the course of the world. And they make decisions that impact our lives the war in Ukraine, the war in Israel, and the Gaza Strip. Decisions that thrust difficult challenges upon you and I, unexpectedly. Whether it be genocide like in Esther's time, War, like in our time, corruption, COVID, whatever it is. We see the fruit of Haman's influence every time we put the news on. But Haman is a product of a much greater problem our fallen world. When I speak about the world, I'm not speaking about the geographic location of Earth in our solar system. When we speak about the world, we're speaking about organized society, hostile towards God, but under the power of the God of this world, Satan. Look with me at John 12, verse 31. Jesus there calls Satan the ruler of this world. C.S. Lewis gives us a great snapshot of the environment you and I live in, the condition of this fallen world. He is, he is making a case between dualism and Christianity. And he says this, he says, Christianity agrees with dualism that this universe is at war. But it does not think this is a war between independent powers, as if Satan is as powerful as God. Satan is a created being. God is not. This is the point he's making. He says it thinks it is a civil war, a rebellion, and that we are living in a part of the universe occupied by the rebel. Enemy-occupied territory, that is what this world is. So we are living in an environment that's occupied by the enemy. 
that, that produces these Hamans, these God-opposing influences that mess with our daily lives. And in the midst of this, you and I are called to fulfill the mission of God. So what does that mean for us today? It means that we must ensure that we prepare ourselves adequately for the times and the environment that we live in. More importantly, it means that we must prepare our faith for what lies ahead. Here is the word of the Lord to you this morning. Tougher times lie ahead. I know this sounds like a bad news message, but it's not. It's a good news message. But we need to understand the reality of our environment. It's not going to get easier. If you read the Bible, it's going to get worse. We find this in the heart of the Lord. In John chapters 13 to 16, Jesus is at the Last Supper. He's about to go to the cross. And he is downloading to his disciples all the important information they need. Remember this, remember that. Do this, don't do that. And after giving them all these final instructions, he says to them, and I want you to know that tough times lie ahead for you. Look at John chapter 16, verse 1 to 4 with me. Jesus says, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. There's our cancel culture right there. If you don't flow with the ways of the world, they'll just cancel you. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. Just before this in chapter 15, Jesus is telling them, you're gonna be persecuted because you carry my name and my image and you're about my kingdom business. That word fall away is the Greek word scandalon. And it means an object placed before someone as an obstacle. Jesus is saying, I don't want the challenges that this fallen environment are going to thrust upon your life to become an obstacle for your faith that it cannot overcome. And so you fall away before I come again. I want you to notice what Jesus doesn't say here. He doesn't say, if you have enough faith, if you really pray very hard, if you put my promises up on your mirror and your bumper stickers and everywhere, this is not going to happen to you. He doesn't say that. What he does say to them in verse 33 is I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Yes. Not you can skip it, you can miss it, you can take a pass on it, but take heart, I have overcome the world. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, church, expect hardship. Amen. Expect it. Again, in what we know as the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24, 6 to 13, the disciples are asking Jesus, so tell us what will the signs be when you are going to come back again for us? Let's read what Jesus says. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. Church, here's a message of hope for us. See that you are not alarmed when all hell is breaking loose around us. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Don't be surprised. 
and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Tougher times lie ahead. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The Lord would have us adequately prepared so that our faith can overcome the obstacles of our fallen environment so that you and I can make it all the way to the end, whether that end is our death or his second coming. But in both warnings, Jesus gives his disciples a key truth. He tells them to align their faith mindset with the realities of their environment. This is a key when it comes to you and I making it all the way to the end. Because it's opposite to our default mindset. You see, we plan for good things to happen. How many of you got a plan for bad things to happen. Put up your hand. We plan for good things to happen, and in fact, as believers, perhaps more so than others, because we've got all these rich, stunning promises of Jesus, and we pray them, we stand on them, we declare them, and that's good, we must, that's what we're called to do, but bad things happen. And when bad things happen, and we're not prepared for that reality, We normally have two responses. We either think something's wrong with our God or something's wrong with our faith. Neither is true. As we've just seen, something is wrong with our environment where you and I must have faith and live. We don't need faith in heaven. How many of you know that? We don't need faith when Jesus comes and his kingdom is established. We need faith now, until that time. Yet, few of us are intentionally equipping our faith to meet and overcome hardship and adversity. Most of us are praying that it doesn't happen to us. And then when it does, we're shocked. because we don't expect to meet them. But I wanna ask you, who here today has had something, some event, unexpectedly smash into their daily lives, upending your life in a way that it leaves you reeling, dealing with newfound, difficult, crushing circumstances? Anybody in here ever encountered one of those? Will you put your hand up? Just take a look around. And if your hand's not up, it doesn't mean that you are never going to meet this. It just means you haven't yet. Like the one that I encountered unexpectedly in 1997, when I discovered that my first husband had a seven-year-old daughter with another woman. We had only been married for seven years. What it meant was that the day we stood promising each other forever, he knew that he had a daughter on the way with another woman. And he did so, planning to hide that from me. And his plan worked. For seven years, I went on building a life with him. I had two beautiful sons with him. But when I discovered this, it swept my feet out from under me. It left me reeling with a new set of circumstances that I now was forced to deal with. 
I had to make decisions in a place where I couldn't even see where I was. I didn't see it coming. And we all have a story to tell about unexpected things, right? I bet if we could have coffee, you could tell me yours, and yours may be way worse than mine. It's a tragedy, a disease maybe, the sudden loss of a loved one, or you've lost your income, whatever it is. Some of you here this morning might be dealing with one right now. Do you remember what it feels like when something unexpected smashes into your life? It feels a bit like this. (laughs) And here's the thing. The unexpected things don't just smash into our natural lives but they impact our faith. Sometimes our faith feels like it's been hit like that. These things test and try our faith like nothing else will. They are the toughest seasons of our lives. We are reeling, we are dealing with difficult circumstances. We are trying to reconcile our loving, faithful God within what's just happened to our lives. And in that place, our faith must work because we recognize, as Jesus has told us, this is an obstacle of my environment that my faith must make it over. But when your faith feels like it's smashed to the ground, how does it work? It's a tall order for our faith. And a lot of us become disillusioned with God in some way, God, why did you let this happen to me? Or God, you let me down. Many of us get confused about who God is in those places. And some of us, and and many of us will know people like this, have let go of God because of some unexpected thing that smashed into their lives. Every shipwrecked soul is as precious to Jesus as a lost soul. These are the two great concerns in his heart regarding his mission on the earth, that the lost will be saved and that their faith will make it all the way to the end. That's the heart of our Lord, so that we do not fall away. You see, we tend to peg our faith to a problem-free life. But Jesus tells us, expect a problem-full life. You see, unprepared faith is vulnerable. When When a crisis smashes into our lives, it's too, and we are falling off the cliff of our crisis, it's too late to start building wings on the way down. We're going to crash. And we've just seen in the rugby tackle, these things smash our lives and our faith. Unprepared, you and I are susceptible to being bamboozled by God's enemy into believing that our God is the same as the God of this world. To believing that our God is responsible for the fruit of this fallen world. He is not. He is not. But you see, when we land on, it's like a snakes and ladders image, when we land on an unexpected thing, the enemy of God is waiting there to feed you with every kind of confusing lie to get you to let go of God's hand, to twist God's true image in your heart, to tell you God kills people, God starts wars. 
God is responsible for the things of this fallen environment. But prepared faith is protected faith. You see, when a crisis hits our lives, we will fall off that cliff because we are dealing with things that are brand new to us and we have been thrust into unknown territory. And here we must navigate our way through with our faith. But when we're falling with wings fixed to our faith, we don't crash. We glide with Jesus. We glide with the Holy Spirit. We overcome. Doesn't mean we don't hurt. It doesn't mean we don't experience loss. It doesn't mean we don't suffer. We do. But we overcome. Because we're prepared. You see, victory is not found in the absence of adversity. Please hear the voice of the Spirit this morning, church. Our victory is not found in a perfect outcome for this election. Our victory is not found in the absence of Hamans and their influences in this world. Our victory is in Christ alone. He has overcome, therefore we can overcome. It doesn't mean we will never meet the obstacle, but it means you and I live with a hope that no one else on this planet lives with, the hope of overcoming whatever may come our way. Jesus says, I've overcome the world. He says, I have overcome, therefore you can overcome. When we understand the inescapable inevitabilities of our fallen environment, we recognize that if our faith is to last, if we are to fulfill the mission God has given to each one of us, Our faith preparation must be in relation to the environment we live in, not relative to our expectations. Our faith preparation must be in relation to the environment, not in relation to what I hope will be. This calls for applied faith. How many of you did mathematics? Applied maths. And then you have to do applied maths. <laughs> you have to take the principles of maths and apply them in every different area of life. If we are going to adequately prepare our faith for what lies ahead, we need to learn how to apply the principles of our faith in the crisis places. We need to know the how-tos We need to have those how-to's wings strapped to our back when we fall off the cliff of the unexpected. This is the message of the book the Lord has given me. One, that we become aware. You and I are gonna meet unexpected things. Two, that we start preparing for them. And I just wanna give you Three quick areas that we need to take discovered truth, what you and I know of Jesus and the word, and convert it into applied truth. Because the distance between those two will determine whether we overcome the obstacle or we succumb to that obstacle. One is our partnership with the Holy Spirit. You see, when you're falling off a cliff and you don't know where you're going, there is one who does. He sees it all. We are limited. He is unlimited. 
so we need to ensure that today we are building a relationship of cooperation with the Holy Spirit where we are hearing his voice clearly so that when we are free falling, we have applied faith to hear the voice of God leading us in the important decisions we need to make when we don't know what's going on and where we're heading. Secondly, we need to know how to build a faith-building perspective. How, with our faith, to see through the now of our difficulties to the bigger picture of God. This is what Jesus encourages us to do as he's preparing his disciples. He says, I want you to know this is going to happen, but there's a bigger picture. So endure. And that's the third thing. We need to discover how to persevere through difficult stuff. How many of you love persevering through difficult stuff? (laughs) None of us. But if our faith is going to last all the way to the end, you and I are going to have to persevere through this fallen environment and everything it throws at our lives. You see, church, we want to be certain of the outcomes of our world, our lives. We put a lot of effort into planning We get a good education so that we can find a good job, so that we can earn a good salary, so we can take care of our loved ones. And we plan and we plan and we plan and we're planning for good. But that's not the reality of our environment. And so let us hear the call of the Spirit this morning to prepare our faith for all eventualities, not just good times. Won't you stand with me? I want to bring this to a close. In the book of Esther, the heat of the battle fell on the Jews. Because the Jews represented God and his mission on the earth. You and I represent God and his mission on the earth as believers. The heat of the battle is going to settle on us as we oppose the Haman influences of our world, as we continue to be salt and light. That's one of the main themes of the book of Revelation. Be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death. See Mordecai standing in sackcloth at the king's gate wailing is the first sign tough times lie ahead for God's people. When Esther sees it, she's tempted to ignore him. She's, shh, stop making such a fuss. You're going to get yourself killed. You see, because Esther, the only one positioned to oppose the influence of Haman on the earth, is in the palace. She's living in a false reality. She's unaware of the dangers that surround her, the forces that are opposing her. But Haman refuses to leave the gate. Thank God he was the prophetic voice that said, we need to prepare for what lies ahead because we have a mission to fulfill. And God does not want us to fall away. So if you will see it this morning, this message of the Lord to you and I is Mordecai in sackcloth. 
sounding the call of the Spirit for you and I to prepare our faith for all eventualities, to adequately prepare our faith, to overcome and last till the very end. I want to pray for you this morning if you are here and you are in the midst of an unexpected thing, some crisis has grabbed hold of your life. You're discouraged, maybe even a bit blame God. Maybe you see how you've confused our God with the God of this world, accredited to His account things that belong solely there. If that's you, won't you just put up your hand? If you're dealing with something unexpected, it might be a disease. It might be the sudden death of a a loved one. Whatever it is, won't you put up your hand? I see your hands. I see your hands. I'm going to pray for you, Father. Would you minister to to our hearts this morning in that unique way that each one who has their hand up needs it, Lord? Father, if they are dealing with disease, if they are dealing with pain in their physical man's, Lord, we ask that you would touch them with your healing power. Restore and heal them, Father, in Jesus' name. But Father, if their pain is one that cannot be seen or felt in their physical man, but it's in their their hearts, Lord, would you pour your hope into their hopelessness? Would you sustain them with your strength and your presence? And Father, I pray for every soul in this place that is in some way trusting you for whatever reason I pray Lord that by your spirit you would minister to them in your love restore them to you Lord I ask it in Jesus name in that way. It was a really powerful word and I feel very challenged personally about preparing our faith and living in the realities of what we are facing. We know what we're facing and we need to be ready for it. So may we do the work this week drawing closer to God, living in His presence so that we can be everything God has called us to be as we go forward. If the ministry team can come forward and if you would still like some more prayer, if you're carrying some hurts and pains from falling off that cliff unexpectedly, Please do come and receive prayer. And for anything else as well, our team is here to minister to you and to speak life into you. Parents, please be reminded to go fetch your kids and to please also just keep an eye on them in the car park. We know how fast and quick they are, so be fast and quicker and keep them safe. Please just get ready to receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. And with the blessing that you have received, will you bless others this week. Amen. To enduring the end is to align our faith mindset with realities to our environment. Victory is not found in the situation going our way, but victory is found in Jesus. Our faith preparation must be in relation to our environment and not our expectations. Um, After this word, I want to pray for some people that sent us their prayer requests. Lord, I want to pray for Carol. 
thank you, Lord, that you are a healer. You are Jehovah Rapha. I pray you heal her from this COVID disease that she's going through. And I pray that you take her out of this space of depression. Lord, you, you love us. And I pray you, you speak to your daughter. You reassure your daughter. And Lord, I want to pray for anyone else who raised their hand for, um, for the difficult circumstance that they may be going through for the unexpected blow that they may have gone through. Lord, comfort them, reassure them. And I I pray, Lord, that in this time, they become stronger than, than, than before. Thank you, Lord, that everything happens for a reason and you have a plan. I pray they remember the scripture that you, you know the plans you have for them and there are plans to prosper them and not to harm them, to give them a, a hope, to give them hope and a future. I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the service as much as I did. Um, thank you for, to, for the new people who joined us as well. Um, I hope you enjoyed the service as well. Enjoy your Sunday.